All right, we're back with part two of the March 30th lecture. Part two, sorry for get, cutting out. I think uh, Zoom has a certain time limit. And so I just gotta uh, send you guys an email. So thanks for signing back in everybody. We're, off, we're a good ways through the lecture, but we got some interesting stuff still ahead. So this is a little stretch break and we're gonna get back into Caravaggio. All right, hello everybody. Let me share the screen here. Just a moment. All right, we're all back. Let me share this with you. Keep going. So as I was saying, this is a very, very dramatic way of, of uh, can everyone see the, the full screen or the say, this guy on the cross here? Yeah. Yes. So, uh, and I think I was talking to Callie. So you can, everything Callie said was great. So really, you are hyper focusing our attention on on the subject matter and eliminating the background. Now, artists in the Renaissance would have said, "Oh, why are you getting rid of the background? It's so important to have the rules of perspective, right? The rule the, have to to accurately depict the background and with accurate depth." But here, the artists have moved on and are really going for a very emotional response. And I would say you guys probably innately understand this is a very theatrical, very emotional. It's almost like you don't, it's, it's self, it's obvious or self evident why the artist would eliminate the background. And yet, I just want to remind you guys that when you do eliminate the background, you almost, it's like you, you remove the moral ambiguity, the moral uncertainty about what's going on. And what I mean by that is it's the same as removing or turning the faces of the figures who are helping crucify this person, because that otherwise, if we saw their faces more clearly, we might feel a little bit of disgust for them, or we might focus on them a little more, but that's not our focus, right? So here, even, not, or similar to the background being gone, you can't even see the faces of the men, because e the artist doesn't want to focus on the context. Even that context isn't as important as us keeping our attention on the target here. And by the way, what is the real center of, of our attention in this painting? Uh, Megan, Megan Dunfuogo. A good answer is uh, Callie. The main focus? Yeah, of this, of this painting. What's our main focal point here? I would say it's the guy on the wood. And what is the guy, who is the guy and what is the wood? Is it St. Peter? Yeah, and what is the wood? The wood, maybe it's a cross. It is a cross. And does anyone know how St. Peter's was crucified? Anyone? Do you, do you, you don't happen to know, Degan. So St. Peter's, I believe, was crucified upside down. So there's, there's crucifixion and then there's crucifixion. And it's very sad to imagine someone being crucified upside down. But let me ask you a question, Megan. Why is... Do you feel sympathy for the man here? Yeah. Why do you feel sympathy for him? Apart because from just, his, yeah. his face looks distressed and they're pulling him against so, his own will. And, and in a way that face is almost the focal point more than even his body perhaps, because you can see his body almost is, is a, like a line that leads to his face. Everything kind of leads to his face as like a, 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 a bullseye in the painting. So yes. let's focus on that face. Tell me specifically the, the, the emotion on his face, Megan. What were you saying? He looks again? like he's looking at something outside of the picture and he looks worried. Yeah, he's a, got a face of absolute concern, like what's going on here? Um, why else do we feel sympathy apart from his, his facial expression, Megan? Because they're dragging him and everyone's going against him in the picture. And, and of course he's being crucified, right? Yes. Right. <laughs> Um, and what, there's one other layer of sympathy, I think, here, Megan, that maybe is easy to overlook. Why, why do we feel sorry for him? As, apart from he's being crucified, apart from, the, from him, he's very sad, maybe apart from he's probably cold because he's half naked and maybe it's cold out, or hot because it's really hot out, or neither. Um, but what else makes us feel sympathy for him? Is he nailed to the cross? Apart from that, although that's a big one. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, good answers otherwise. Great, great job. Uh, who, uh, um, Macy, you're like below that Megan's uh, avatar. What do you think, why, why else do we feel sympathy for him? 
Justin, maybe not Mason. Victoria, are you there? Yeah. Oh, we got Justin in the house. Let me hear from Justin. Sorry, hold on, Victoria. Justin, why do you think we feel, what's another reason we might feel sympathy for St. Peter? Um, he's not, like, dressed completely. Okay, that's, it's humiliating to be totally naked. I think that's a good one. Especially if you are what? There's one other key thing here that we haven't said yet. If you're old. There we go. <laughs> Who said, is that Callie? Yeah, that's me. Good. So, yes. He's, he's not just old, like I'm old, but there's my dad old. <laughs> so there's old, like Santa Claus old, right? And so it's like you're crucifying Santa Claus here, right? Sorry to use Santa Claus. But that's how you would feel if you saw Santa Claus crucified. Like, why are you doing this to this poor man, right? Yeah. The only way you could make this more sympathetic is if it's grandma instead of grandpa, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I got to get those images out of my head. So anyway, here we have a picture of, of the crucifixion of St. Peter, right? Uh, Callie, let me ask you a follow-up to since you chimed in accurately about that. So why, and good answer just about him being nude. That's certainly a shameful thing, right? It's a state of disgrace. So Callie, what, who is St. Peter's? Why does he matter? Um... I honestly don't know who he is. Do we know the St. Peter, the name St. Peter elsewhere? Yes. Where do we know that from, from recent it, lectures? Um, wasn't it that like big sort of church dome looking place? Like yes, Saint so Peter? the capital of the Catholic church is St. Peter's in Rome. Yeah. The, the big building we've been looking at and looking inside of. So who do you think it was named after? Him. <laughs> and so once again, this is much more than just a picture of a guy being crucified. In, the, in terms of the history at this time, knowing what I just said a moment ago about the church, trying to remind everyone about the importance of the church, right? Trying to remind you, the church is great. Don't leave the church. You love the church. The church is awesome. How does this painting relate to that? Um, probably to remind everyone that St. Peter, I guess if people idolized him also, I assume no, he sinned. Yeah, yeah. So think about and, it. Yeah, go on. Yeah, and maybe it's sort of a message that he also died for his sins, such as Jesus did, and that you should be grateful and kind of go back to the church and repent your sins. Right. It's easy to look at the building that we've been looking at, right, and, and see the awesome size and scale of the building, St. Peter's. And, yeah. and that's one way to get people like, oh, it's like heaven has been built and brought down to earth with gods and this beautiful gold and everything in space and light and yada, yada, mm -hmm. yada. But then another way to do it is to show a picture of St. Peter and to remind people, oh, you see this church, it's all glitz and extravagance. But remember who the real St. Peter is, this old man who is naked in the middle of the morning, tied up upside down on a cross and nailed to it, right? Yes, yeah. it's, it's really messed up if you think about it. And one more layer on top of that is you can probably now understand why it's so important to remove the identity of the three figures who are crucifying St. Peter's, right? Because mm -hmm. in a way, if you include them, it's almost would feel like whoever is looking at this painting, you, me, Christians from back then, they would feel like, oh, shoot, that might have been me kind of participating in that. And that might, you know, the equivalent, like you're not necessarily St. Peter's you're probably the person crucifying him, right? So maybe that, and I'm just offering this as one possibility, maybe the reason why the artist, in addition to hiding them so we focus on him, he also didn't want to kind of in, visually implicate the average person in the crucifixion. You're rather supposed to focus just on sympathizing with him as the crucified saint. Yeah. And by the way, his body, is does his body look like it's, it's the right age for him? No, not at all. All right, so oddly enough, like he might be okay. <laughs> if he's that fit, he might survive the crucifixion, right? He's in pretty good shape. He could probably help him with that cross better, better than they could. So just keep in mind, it's, it's funny, we still see the strong body on the old face, just like we saw at the, at the Tampa Museum with Neptune. It, not much has changed. So let's keep looking at a few more examples of Caravaggio's work. Uh, here we have a picture. Uh, can you see this okay, uh, Ryan Iverson? Yeah. Uh, what are we looking at here? Um, it kind of looks like they're like uh, beheading the uh, man there. And which, what do you think, of, what's the focal point here? Uh, the focal point 
Um, to me, I would say it's the guy who's being uh, who's a head is uh, who's is being cut off. I would say. And you notice the blood spurting out from where the dagger mm -hmm. is being. So in a way, the movement of the blood spurting out is mm -hmm. is part of the focal point, and in a way that that maybe catches your eye, both because of the red and because of the movement that's kind of of the blood spurting out at us, um, and that really kind of emphasizes the focal point as well. Maybe the mm -hmm. fact that the sword is going towards his head, that her arms are reaching towards him, his head is in the middle of the canvas. And what is that facial expression, uh, Ryan? How would you describe that expression? Um, I would describe it probably as like... One word. Agony, maybe. Okay, agony, shock. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think that yeah. agony is a pretty good one. Uh, mm -hmm. AJ Rizzo, can you hear me, AJ? Yeah. What's the facial expression on the woman on the far right? The older woman. I don't know if you see her. Woman. Cheers. I don't know. Her eyes are pretty like wide open. I don't know. Okay, that's. I think that's an accurate element of of her sort of intensity. You know, she's very like. Tell me if I'm wrong. Uh, I'm gonna see if I can do my eyes like she's doing it here. So she's like, like looking on, like, like very, like very into it, right? Do you agree? She's very into it. Yeah, I think she likes it. So, so, so the lady on the right, she's very into what's going on. Like she's like fixated on it. Is that the same emotion, uh, AJ, as the woman who's doing the beheading? No, I feel that she cares. I don't know. I feel like she has a face on that she cares a little more, that she shows it. I don't know. Be more specific. She's You're more on the right sweet. track. She's more sweet. What about her? Once she's younger, so there's clearly like a sense of youth. And in a way, maybe she shouldn't be the one doing this. Maybe the older woman is a little more like a fitting person for me doing this, perhaps. But certainly she's young and, and full of life. Um, and, and what else about it, about that facial expression? How, how else would you describe that facial expression, uh, AJ? What, what else is going on there? Like, think about when you might, make, might, when you might be holding something in your hands and making that face. What would you be doing to make that face? I, I don't know. Okay, that's fine. Bianca, let me, you just chimed in. How, how are you? Can you hear me okay? Yes. Can you see the painting okay? Yes. So when might you make a face like that where you're like, kind of like, like this, like? Um, if you're confused, uh, if someone, like what, the, the lady's face? Yeah, so she's, but she's also got her hand, like when you're doing something with your hands, and you make that face. What's what's an activity when you might make that face? Mm. Uh, I don't know if you're like if you're like cutting wood and like it gets like in your face. Or it's specific, like, I was I was gonna say cutting on chopping onions, but I think yeah, chopping oh. wood. So, so tell me specifically that chopping wood is great, even better. She said, so the, like, I guess the, the splinters or the wood chips or whatever, the dust doesn't get in your face. Is that what you mean? Yes. Great. So a great example. I'm sure all of you guys chop a lot of wood, so you can relate to this one. Uh, but it's, it's, I think absolutely you can relate to it because there's something about the way she's turning her head, right? Mm -hmm. And what is she turning her head in, in almost subconscious reaction to? to to protect your face from from possibly what from the blood and perhaps the blood right in a way it's like if you're cutting into something that might stain you or maybe even to turn away from the guilt like the blood corresponds to the feeling of like guilt like she's mm -hmm. gonna feel guilty about what she's doing to look away maybe even from his facial expression but you what i want you guys to observe is the artist has given you an extremely specific emotion on the face. And the artist can only give you that specific emotion if the artist is totally in touch with the way all of us experience our, the activities that we do so that he can give you that emotion as a part of a trio of three emotions that correspond very specifically to the specific thing that they're doing. So in this case, the man's agonizing face corresponds, understandably, to his head. It's sort of like being woken up by an alarm clock, like you guys were an hour ago, like getting, oh, the agony, right? 
But the other two phases are very specific, and it's not just like, oh, a young woman cutting off a guy's head and getting really into it. It's almost like she feels some hesitation. She feels the way any of us would feel doing something like this, because we're clearly looking at someone who's probably obligated to do something horrible, and yet it's not like she's really into it. And what is the value of, of her not being really into what she's doing, Callie? Why do you think the artist wanted to show that she's got some hesitation? Um, probably to show that she's not doing it out of, I guess, weirdly pleasure. Like it's something that she had to do, but didn't want to do. Great, perfect answer. So she's doing it, her, her hesitation makes her a better person because she's only doing it out of obligation, not malice, right? Yeah. Now, what about the woman on the right? How do you feel about her? Um, I think it seems that it's like also not enjoyable, you know? Good, I agree. And how about, but what specifically, how is it uh, like a different shade of emotion? What's her specific shade there? Um, it looks like with her eyebrows, how they're kind of like furrowed and the way that her eyes are and her mouth, it's just her facial construction where it kind of shows that she's not so much like, oh, this is great. I'm beheading someone, but yeah, she's, she's not turning away. Like the other yeah. woman is slightly turning away from it. And yeah. in a way she does, they both might need to turn away, but it's like the other woman is way more fixated. I like what you said yeah. about the eyebrows. So you know, if your eyebrows, when, when do your eyebrows do this? Like just one example, like when, like I haven't done this very much, but when I do this, when would like, I do this? <laughs> you're shocked. Right, and do we see that sense of shock in the painting? Um, are you talking, is there another woman in the painting? Well, no, there... the, well, no the guy in fact has that kind of, in a way yeah. oddly has the same kind of eyebrows up as the woman, oddly enough. Like it's almost like a mirror image, but the uh, inverse, like where the guy's like in agony, and she's almost like, like sometimes when we're looking at someone suffering, we imitate like what they're doing unconsciously because it's like we're we're feeling it too. So it's like someone yeah. might do this and be like, oh, like you do it too. And that's kind of just part of the fact because she's so fixated on it and she's not involved in the activity, at least directly, like like in contact with it. In a way, she's almost mirroring the guy's image and, and she feels a lot more malicious, doesn't she? Yeah. Or at least a little more than the girl, not just because she's older. <laughs> But because it's in a way she's not like she's not reacting to it in a like shocked way. She, like like she's not turned away. You notice the what the main woman's eyes, the young woman, her her eyes are like this, like 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 that. And it's very like adds confusion or like a sense of hesitation just to do this. But this is more like a reaction, right? This this expression is like a reaction. Whereas this is like you're folk, you're doing something you don't want to do, right? Oh, you're see. Remember all this, by the way, there's good body language rules. Go ahead. I can't see the older woman in the painting because our um, avatars like cover it up. So that's why I was confused when you were saying to other people, because I can only see the younger woman and the guy. There we go. Okay. You can move your avatar. Yeah, I moved it. You move your avatar. Sorry, I didn't know you could do that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. I did we're not all know. Here. We're I, all here helping out. Okay, so you can see her now, right? And at least yeah. you see her a little better. So, you know, yeah. she, what do you think she's doing with her hands there, the older lady? Um, it kind of looks like she's holding on to fabric, and I don't know if that's where they're going to put the head or not, but it bingo. looks like... Bingo, that's a bingo. Oh, okay, so it looks like she's tightly holding on to it, like waiting for the head. Right, so that adds a whole other layer of yikes, right, of gruesomeness yeah. to the painting, where it's late, so basically you can now kind of understand this painting, and you notice we basically looked at the facial expressions of the figures, really to help understand what's going on here. And that goes back to, again, the era we're looking at. We're not looking at the context. We're not looking even at a lot of the, the bodies. We're not looking at naturalism of the figure. We're looking at a hyper focus on emotion and the face as a sort of theatrical epicenter of all the drama. And here you have the older woman about to receive the beheaded man's head and put it in the bag. And she's almost like the enabler. She's like the old woman enabling the young woman to do this horrible deed, right? Yeah. And you'd have to look into the whole story of this. I don't have time for now. This is a biblical story. There are many different depictions of this painting. What I would point out is Caravaggio uses a lot of the same model, the woman model, in a lot of his paintings. And we'll see that in a moment. But here's a painting from the same, uh, of the same subject matter by a female artist named Artemisia Gentileschi. I think Kai is writing about this. And you can see a very different sort of arrangement of the scene. And I don't want to spend too much time on the scene, but 
uh, maybe Bianca, what is one, one difference between the way the two artists tackled the same scene here? Um, the, the woman looked more conscious. The woman looks more concentrated on the on um, cutting the man's head off. On the right. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree. In a way, she has a little bit of the same kind of like disgust about what she's doing, but but because she doesn't maybe come across as so maybe young and innocent, she doesn't have the same moral kind of I can't forgive the the woman on the right seems a little more like frightening to me. Because she's a little, but 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 me, but not. That, but I also don't feel sympathy for the guy, perhaps as much. But I do feel like maybe a little more sympathy, maybe for the white guy on the right, because he seems kind of innocent too. But I would just point out that all these little subtle arrangements are really important. Even the woman in the middle, she's not as old, so maybe you feel like she's not as kind of. But she's also more involved in the crime. This makes more sense that she would be holding down the figure. I think that makes more sense that both would be involved in holding him down. So I would just point out there are two very dramatic images of the same subject treated differently. Here, the sword coming straight down, I think is a little more powerful for feeling like a sense of cutting. Uh, but let's go on and take a, few, a look at a few more pictures before we end. Uh, can I have 10 more minutes of your guys' time? Is that right? Yeah. If, you, if you need to leave, it's all yeah. good. So here we have another picture showing uh, the background is gone. And once again, the artist has removed two of the facial expressions, at least to a degree. You can mainly see the angel's face and you can see the boy's face ever so slightly. In this painting, this is God telling Jacob, I'm sorry, Isaac, or I think his father's Isaiah or Jacob, I can't remember which, telling him, or, yeah, I can't remember the name of the father. He's telling him to sacrifice his son in the name of the Lord. But in the last minute, at the last minute, the angel intervenes and says, no, don't kill your son. You've proven your faith in God. Cut this lamb, kill this lamb instead. There you see the lamb. So, uh, Callie, I'm gonna ask you again. So you kind of got this really well. So, how do we? How would you feel if a man said he he was gonna cut off his son's head to prove his faith in God, but last minute an angel came and he didn't do it, and he's at your dinner party? <laughs> this man. How would you feel about this man? Uh I mean, it probably would be really confusing and sort of like, why would you kill yourself? I guess it's sort of a relief because he doesn't have to kill a son now. He just has to kill a lamb. So it's, I think we all know it's sort of a symbolic story about you know, faith in God. And yet, yeah. and yet what I think is so interesting about it is because anyone who reads the Old Testament, when you read the book of Job, the book of Job is about a man who suffers and suffers and God just makes him suffer and suffer. And he keeps suffering and page after page, he's suffering and suffering. And again, then God's like, okay, it's over. You've proven that you can suffer a lot. You're a good Christian. You're like, what? I, yeah. <laughs> what? What's and this is a similar story where it's like, whoa, you're killing your son. And we all know that it's symbolic. It's not about a man necessarily actually doing it, but the story is, it is about you understanding that you need to be willing to sacrifice for God. Just, it yeah. doesn't need to be your son, but just you need to understand the basis of sacrifice. So what's so interesting here is in this effort to visualize the Bible and make people care more about the church and biblical subject matter, the artist has given you almost a literal photograph, if you will, of the scene where a guy's doing this deed. And what I would argue is when you go so realistic with a scene like this, with such hyper-realism, how can you not but almost start treating this as a literal thing? And when you do start treating this literally, like a guy's actually killing his son, you're forced to confront the moral problem of why would you kill your son, right? Yeah. And I think the artist has, has dealt with that visual problem of us feeling like, oh, wait, <laughs> wait a second, why are you killing your son? That's messed up. And the artist has addressed that or made us kind of overlook that by putting the boy, the son in darkness, right? So that we yeah. don't necessarily focus on what we would probably focus on, which is that poor kid. We focus on the angel instead and the solution, the good outcome. So I think it's a very clever way of visually avoiding the moral cul-de-sac, the moral dead end of there's no situation where killing your son is okay. 
Yeah, no. Unless it's like Jesus and you're God, right? So I would just point that out. It's a very interesting element of art in this era or aspect of it when they, when you push art, religious art, to a almost literal realism, it's, it's sort of like, that's why we don't have a photograph of Jesus on the cross, not just because photography wasn't invented, but because religious painting or religious artwork by definition isn't about providing proof. It's about symbolism, metaphor, parable, lessons, right? There's no, you don't read it literally. You're meant to extract a lesson, some sort of divine lesson from the story. And so there's this weird irony to the, the church almost enlisting artists to paint vividly realistic images from the Bible because it makes the morality all the more tricky to sort of compromise, find visual harmony with. You guys follow what I mean by that? Yeah. Okay, it's kind of a nuanced point, but you'll see a little bit more of it like for here. And you see the same model here. We're almost done, so I'll let you guys go in a moment. So here we see the same model here. And notably, this is David. I'll probably use a female model to play David here. And you see the head of Goliath. Um, and the similar fate, you see the similar face of, of remorse on the face of David feeling bad about what he's just done, which is cut off the head. So here we have a whole new version of David. Here it's not David as a sculpture, but rather as a young man who's just cut off the head of, of Goliath. And he feels a lot of sympathy for Goliath or feels some sadness about what he's done. And that emotional power is all the more powerful because you eliminate the background and it causes things like David, his body to pop out, but especially the face of Goliath to pop out. So again, that use of chiara oscuro. You notice he's really pushing that bleeding head right out into our sort of presence, almost making it more gruesome, making us almost recoil so we don't get stained by the dripping blood. Here you can see a landscape by Caravaggio. And I would point out, the same artist, I would point out that when you guys look at a landscape, or I'm sorry, not a landscape, a bowl of fruit, what am I talking about? <laughs> a bowl of fruit. You guys all see the bowl of fruit here? Basket of fruit? Yes. So when you look at a basket of fruit, remember, when we live in the modern era, we take for granted that we can get lettuce and vegetables and fruit all year round from Florida and California or Mexico or Central America or Spain because it's imported in refrigerated containers and trucks and freight trains, right? Yes. So if we see a basket of fruit in the, in, in the 20th century, in the, ninth, in the year 2020, we can't guarantee what time of year it is, right? It could be any time of year. Correct? Yeah. Okay, but this painting is from the 1600s. So can we determine what time of, time of year it is from this painting? Yeah, probably. How so? Because if you think about it, the only time that they could probably harvest like really nice fruit like this would be in the springtime or summertime and you can kind of tell by the why light. Why is that? But why is that? Um, because in the winter and the fall, it's a little bit more difficult to grow fruit like that because of the temperature. Right. So they don't, they don't have refrigerated, they don't have uh, trains that carry refrigerated produce from California in the middle of winter, right? So yeah. So just keep in mind, for us, you probably never looked at, it was, until I studied art history, I would never have looked at a basket of fruit and thought, oh, that's something you could only have painted in the fall or the spring or the summer because it's specific to the climate, it's the seasonality of food. This would be people who love locally grown food, eating by the grace of the seasons. They would love this because it shows the fruit of the seasons, right? And so you yeah. can't fake this. this. You can't put this in a refrigerator and then, and then paint it. So this is really a painting that we can't really appreciate in the same way because this is the artist taking fruit that's been freshly harvested, putting it in a basket for it to ripen and eat it as needed, but you can't refrigerate it. It's gonna perish. You can see the, even the, element, the rotting elements on the apple, very subtle allusion to death and to decay. And it's very different than how we understand fruit, which is, t it has no sense of time. Fruit is from any time of the year for us. But from back then, they're really painting a moment, a, a moment in time, as well as a sort of a still life. So let's end on one more painting, if we can. Can we do one more painting, guys? Yeah. Okay, so we'll do one more with Caravaggio. Uh, Bianca, I know we promised we'd talk about the, this one. So I might uh, actually, go ahead to that one real fast. So I wanted to talk about this painting next to this one because it's a very interesting use of uh, maybe the similar Chiara Oscuro, the light and dark, maybe more so on the one on the left, which is the girl with the pearl earring. 
But what I want to point out is the artists are really hypersensitive to subtleties of the human body in terms of naturalism. And as I was talking with Bianca uh, yesterday, you can see that on the left with the attention to the details on the woman. Um, let me ask you, uh, uh, let's see, uh, Victoria, what kind of details on the left, on the woman's face or the things she's wearing are, would you say are very specific or show extreme attention to observation of the subject? Um, her eyes. What about her eyes? The way that they're kind of looking off to the side. So number one, they're looking at a specific direction, right? They're maybe, they're, they're kind of, they correspond to her turning her head and the eyes correspond to the way your, your eyeballs might sort of move accordingly, right? But what is specifically about the eyes? Um, the one of them kind of is looking straight at you. But what's specifically about the, the, the eyeball? Bianca's getting flashbacks to her conversation yesterday. <laughs> what about the eyeball, Victoria? What do you see? What, what shows that the artist is observing the way an eye actually looks? Say hi. And I don't mean the way it's looking at us, but rather just the appearance of an eyeball. That's my I picture. guess the colors. Okay, the colors, but there's something out where, see, and this is, I'm glad you're saying this, because this is all, these are all the things that we kind of have come to assume are the major, the things we expect to see with an eyeball, right? It's looking at us, the color of the eye, but that's almost in a way, that's a way of looking at the eye as something that's engaging us, that's looking at us, but just look at the eye on its own merits. Like if I said, um, look at this marker here, right? So it's blue and it's white, right? But what do you see in the middle right here? Victoria, what do you see, especially right now, what do you see on, on the marker on the top? What do you mean, like the size-wise, or what do you what do you say? Like the size? No. So I'm going to show. So you see the marker. Um. So you don't see it, and now you do. What am I talking about? The reflection. Ah. So do reflections matter? Yes. So let me ask you a question. Why do you think we overlook? We tend to overlook reflections when we talk about things that have a reflection. Like, why do you think when we look at the, her eyeballs? Uh, why do you think, uh, for I think most of us, if not all of us, we would focus on the way she's looking at us, the angle of her eyes, and the color of her eyes, but probably none of us would talk about the fact that her eye has a reflective light in it. Why do you think we tend to overlook reflections, uh, Victoria? Um, because it's not as common, like you don't see it in other people. Yeah, it's, in a way, it's almost easy to overlook because it doesn't necessarily form a part of matter. Like it's not like... Like, if this is something, I can hear it, I, it's a thing. I don't think of the reflection on it as necessarily part of it. And yet, and yet, it's so important if you really want to capture the world the way the world actually looks. If I wanted to draw this marker, I guarantee you the marker, ver the, the version of my painting that you like better is the one that actually has the reflection on it. And again, why is that? Why is it better? Or why is that reflection matter? What is, what is it really? What does that correspond to? It corresponds to the way it actually looks, right? Right, right, Victoria? Yeah. So uh, on that same note, Mark, what else on her face, like specifically her lips or the uh, earring, what else shows that same attention to detail, the way the world actually looks? Can you hear me? Yeah, I, I hear you now. Um, what did you guys already say? Well, the eyeball, the way the eyes have a reflection in it. What about the lips and the and the earring shows a similar attention to the way the world actually looks? Um, there's like a slight, like almost like a glimmer. Oh, it's yeah. like a shadow effect on the earring. The shadow, or even the reflection on it, right? Yeah. That right, teardrop, that teardrop shaped reflection probably indicates that it's that it's round. And and what about the lip gloss on the lips of the woman, uh, Callie? What is that? Does that lip gloss show the same attention to sort of detail? Um, I would say so, yeah. And you and we all, a woman especially, know lip gloss has a certain extra layer of wow, right? It's a little yeah. extra layer of, of glimmer, of glamour. And notice the artist is observing that level of detail. And it's so interesting to observe 
uh, an artist doing that because it just shows a whole new level of like looking at the world and not not seeing things, right? And yeah. it's important because it's it's. I'll, and let's end on this, or actually, we'll end on it in a second because I want to end on this guy. But I would point out that if her lip being glossy aren't important then wearing lip gloss is not important right and no yeah. one would say that not that if you're putting lip gloss on then it's important right so we shouldn't overlook those things if people are willing to put it on it's probably something we what we we see so you don't want to overlook it when we're seeing it in a painting similarly and here's where we'll end this guy on the right you can see this guy on the right he's, he's posed with this very thick clothing on right yeah. So you, what you see on his face, that sort of, uh, that, that similar kind of glow? Yeah, I would say so. What's causing that? The lighting in the painting. And what's the lighting reflecting off of? Um, it looks like it's reflecting off of their bodies. I don't really know where it's coming from. So but... Eddie, let's, get, let's let me pick on someone else. Uh, uh, Justin, can you see this man's face here? Oh, uh, yeah. So what do you think the re light is reflecting off of? Um, maybe like the wall or something. But I mean, on his face, what is the light reflecting off of on his face? When does light reflect off your face like that? Um, Anyone else want to chime in there? Anyone know what I'm talking about? When does light reflect off your face like that? When there's like a spotlight on you. Uh huh. But but what specifically about your face makes it so reflective? When you're like sweating or oh, perspiring. Good. Who said that? Macy. Late Macy. Good job. We're gonna end on with this last follow-up question, Macy. So why do you think he's sweating? And that's a very good answer. Why is he sweating? Um, because like you said, he's in like a lot of uh, clothing, like heavy looking clothing. Right, and uh, that's exactly it. So here's a painting of an artist and we'll see him on on Wednesday in, uh, in he, pa he painted this painting. This artist basically, this is a painting of him showing himself wearing noble clothing because he achieved nobility. He's a Jewish artist. And if you remember in Spain, they persecuted the Muslims and they persecuted the Jews. The Jews are very persecuted in Europe. But this artist was so talented that he became a noble. He was made into a, no, a noble person, a sir, a lord, whatever you call it, because his painting skills were so good that the king of Spain made him an, a, a, an honorary noble. So he became Catholic. And so it's a painting really showing a man who has achieved the greatest achievement possible. He has become a noble person, you know, a noble aristocrat. And I would argue that this painting is showing him sweating. It's a self-portrait of the artist. And he's showing himself sweating because he wants you to know that he struggled to get to where he got. So that sweat on his face corresponds to him working hard and showing that he doesn't want to hide the sweat. He wants you to see it. He doesn't want to, to, to Photoshop out the sweat on his face, if you will. He's a painter, he could but he wants to show you that he's sweating because he worked hard to achieve this moment that he's standing and celebrating, which is like a selfie wearing his amazing clothing and he's sweating profusely, but he wants to show you that because it symbolizes his struggle to achieve what he achieved with his paintbrush. And we'll pick up on Wednesday with this painting and you can see the artist there on the upper left same guy and so i hope you guys could see from this lecture the importance of this detail the sense of this attention to detail as a part of naturalism but as a specifically as a new degree of observation that deepens people's connection to what we're looking at um whether it's uh someone who's religious or otherwise it just adds a whole new a level of emotional detail and that chiaro oscuro light and dark also uh, heightens that sense of emotionality. So I will see you guys on Wednesday. Before you guys hang up, how many of you guys are in Tampa? They say, tell me if you're in Tampa or not. Uh, Ryan. Ryan, Ryan, just just Ryan. Jonathan. Jilly and Jilly, Jilly and uh, and Plenzas, right? And Jonathan, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, 
I will, if you need any old Zoom videos, let me know. Um, and if you still need to talk to me, I think most of you I spoke to, except for AJ. Victoria, have I spoken to you?